Marshall. Bill Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. We good? We're good. Okay. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. All right. We'll just take a second here. Welcome in our stream family. Thank you for joining in with us. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Romans, chapter 8, for a hot second this morning. Um, if you have a prayer request or any, any need, hit us up in the chat. We have somebody standing by that will uh, will add will add our faith to your faith and believe God for a miracle. Amen. Uh, the book of Romans is where I want to start out this morning. The title of my message is, God is Good. Um, I really struggled this week on well, what, is, what is it that you would have me to speak? I, I just don't want to share from, from my heart, from my knowledge, from my wisdom, because that is very minimal. Uh, very, very minimal. Uh, I was in a meeting on Friday night and I, I felt like I was definitely not the smartest person in the room. I, I'm like listening to people talking like, holy smokes, man, these people are smart. And uh, so anyways, um, my wisdom, my knowledge is, is, is mere pebbles to the Lord. And so I just wanted to seek out the heart of God. And so I struggled this week. Well, what is that you'd have me speak? The week began to wind down. I'm like, God, it's uh, getting close here. I need to get something prepared, uh, get something ready. And then this began to drop in my spirit. Um, and then Tim picked out songs this morning for worship. And the first song was right out the gate, God is good. And I'm like, God, you are good. Thank you for confirming your message. Uh, so I want to talk about the goodness of God. Sometimes we as children of God or just people in general forget how good God really is. Um, you know, the, the proof of God's goodness is not that everything in life is rosy and everything in life is perfect. Everything is, in life is smooth sailing. Uh, that is not the proof of God's goodness. A lot of times people think, well, OK, if I give my heart to the Lord and I start serving God, then everything's going to be perfect, right? Everything's going to be good. Wrong. That's not the case. As a matter of fact, the moment you, you give your heart to the Lord and you start serving God is the moment you become more valuable. You become valuable. Uh, you are, wh whether you serve God or not, you are valuable. Um, but you are valuable now to the kingdom of God. And when you're valuable, the enemy becomes attracted to you. Uh, as a matter of fact, in John chapter 10, and verse 10, you can read it on your own time. I'll just quote it for you. It says, the thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. And the last part of that verse is my favorite part. It says, but I have come that you may have life and life more abundantly. The first part of that verse, the thief comes to steal. Uh, so the enemy is a thief. I don't know about you, but I don't like thieves. I don't like them. Uh, they, they, they take what doesn't belong to them. They take what they haven't worked for, uh, and they try and to enjoy it. And that's not right. Um, I work hard for my money. I work hard for the things I'm able to do and my family's able to do. And for somebody to try and steal from me frustrates me. Um, not that I've experienced that very much in the past, but if I were to experience it, that, I know that I would be pretty, uh, pretty angered over that and pretty upset. So, uh, I don't I don't care for thieves, um, but the enemy is a thief and he comes to steal from you because you are valuable. See, a thief doesn't come and steal something from you that's not valuable. You got to hear that this morning. If the enemy is coming to steal something from you, it's because you have something of value. If you don't have anything of value, then nobody comes knocking on your door. They could give a rip what you have in your house if you aren't valuable, if you don't have anything to steal, they don't care what you have. But the moment they know that you have something that is of value, that is the moment in which they begin to devise a plan and begin to try and execute a plan to steal from you. And that's the enemy in a nutshell. So you are valuable. So, so uh, you know, the moment you give your heart to the Lord and you begin to start serving God, you are there's a whole nother value that's added to your life, if you would. Um, and the enemy sees that. And so, you know, not everything is roses and everything is perfect and everything is easy. The moment you serve God, as a matter of fact, sometimes it becomes just a little bit more challenging. People say, oh, serving God's for the week. Try it. <laughs> get, get, give it a whirl. Try it and tell me how much it's for the week. You know, the enemy desires to still kill and destroy you, not just you, but your family. You know, sometimes 
Sometimes we, we've got to we've got to go into battle and we've got to fight the battle. But I've got news that God is good. Amen. And so despite the difficulties and the challenges and the troubles uh, that happen in our life, God is uh, determined to use them for the greatest good of our life that he can. In Romans chapter eight and verse 28, it says this. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Hold that up there for a second, Christy. The, the scripture here, a lot of people quote the scripture and they say, well, all things work together for good. They want to stop right there. But you have to finish the scripture. The scripture, the Bible isn't like a smorgasbord and we just get to pick and choose what we want. Amen. Right? I remember growing up going to a smorgasbord and the smorgasbord that we always went to and some of you may remember is King's Table. Anybody remember King's Table in town, right? That was the old school smorgasbord. I remember my dad, we, we brought him, uh, we brought one of my dad's friends from Mexico and he, the first time he'd ever been here in the States and we went through King's Table and we got to the end of the line at King's Table and then we took our trays and we, we sat down at the table and my dad's friend, uh, Danielle is his name, and he sat down and he looked at my dad and he said it in Spanish, but I knew what he was saying. He said, ¿Dónde está the tortillas? Where's the tortillas at? And my dad starts laughing. He's like, yeah, no, there's no tortillas here. <laughs> you know, but I remember at King's Table, I was, because I'm a very picky eater. And so I would pick and choose. And I, I'd say, no, I don't want that. I want just, I, I only want this. You know, back then, like green stuff just didn't touch my plate. Like green stuff was not even an option for my plate. I hated green stuff. And even to this day, I sometimes I have to force myself to eat a salad or eat anything green. I'm not like Carter or sorry, Carson, that dude, if it's green, he'll it doesn't matter what it is. He'll eat it. Uh, does he eat spinach, Nick? You don't ever he's never had spinach. That'd be interesting to know if he eats spinach because that's stuff. I don't know. Yeah, raw. OK. But it doesn't, I don't know, Carson's favorite color has always been green. And so I don't know if it's because of that, but it doesn't matter if what it is green, like he will eat green. Me, I'm the exact opposite. Like brown is my color because I grew, I grew up on beans. So if it's, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to eat beans, you know, but uh, no, it's, it, you know, we, we go through a smorgasbord and we, we like, oh, I want this. I want that. I want a little bit of this. I want a little bit of that. And that stuff I do not like. So I'm not going to have, the Bible isn't like that. Like we can't just take half of the scripture and say, that's what I want and that's good and I'm going to leave the rest. We can't do that. And so the rest of the scripture reads, uh, uh, for those who are who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose, everything works together for good. And so the, the proof of God's goodness is, isn't the fact that your life is perfect. And see, we live in a filtered world today. Everything is filtered. You look at Facebook. Everybody, you know, we, 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 we look at Facebook and we, we look at everybody's life is just perfect and, and everybody just looks good. Nobody posts a picture of themselves waking up right out of bed and your hair standing all crazy. You, you know, ladies, your, your makeup's not on or if it's, if it was left on, it's, it's in all places that it shouldn't be. And, and you know, you, you have that green, uh, cloud hovering in front of you because your breath stinks. You know, nobody posts those pictures. Everybody posts the pictures that look beautiful and look good. Every, you know, we, everything's just, just right. You know, we, we dig that, that heart shaped thing in this. I'm messing with Brooke. And we dig that heart shaped thing in the sand and we put our phone over it and or inside of it and we stand over it and we, we take a picture and we're in this perfect shaped heart, uh, heart shaped thing in the sand and it looks beautiful. I'm messing with her, but, but seriously, we, we, we always, we, we, you know, there's these people, you, maybe you know them, but I, I know one in particular, there's this person that this person knows how to take selfies. Like they've got the selfie angle down. Like I, I'm not a selfie person. I look worse in selfies. So I'm like, I don't want to take a selfie, but this person knows how to take selfies. And, and, and you look at that person, you're like, holy smokes. That person has lost so much weight and is looking so good. And then you look at them in real world and you're like, wait, wait a minute. 
what is going on here? Because you didn't look like that in your picture, in your profile pic. And so we live in a filtered world because we want to make everybody think that everything is perfect. And unfortunately, everything is not perfect. You know, we've, we've been painting, a picture has been painted, a perfect picture has been painted of marriages where, where husband and wife, they're, they're holding hand in hand and they're skipping down the street. And, you know, everything is just good and dandy and perfect. And you're like, well, why isn't my marriage that way? Because no marriage is that way. Every marriage is like an ocean. You, you, you're sometimes you're on the high and you're on the, on the top of the waves. And sometimes, you know what? The wave just comes crashing down and everybody gets a little bit of salt in their mouth. Amen. And we all get a little salty sometimes. That's just the way life goes. But we think, oh, you know, I serve God. So everything ought to be perfect. That is so wrong. And that is not the case. But the, uh, the definition, um, of, of, you know, the proof or the proof of God's of good, God's goodness is the fact that whenever something does go wrong, God's going to turn it around and use it for his glory. And it's all going to work out for good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. My first point here is when life is unfair, God is good. When life is unfair, God is good. As the boys have been growing up and, and, and getting older, from from little, we've always tried to we always tried to make everything fair. You know, when when one one kid got something, then the other kid would get something. You know, it's a, especially when they're twins. You know, you always got to try and make it fair. You know, and, and 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 sometimes I would just simply tell the boys, I'm like, you know what, life's not fair. You know, I, I remember, and, and maybe it's because they're twins. We tried to make it a little more fair. But I remember I was four years apart from my from my uh, brother that's next in age to me uh, that I grew up with. And and life, I can tell you, guaranteed was not fair for me, especially in my eyes. Life was not fair. He got to go and and, and do things that I didn't get to go do. Uh, but it's be, simply because he was older than me. But I viewed it as life was unfair. It was not fair, the fact that he would get to go do things and do whatever, and I had to be at home. He got to stay out later, and I had to come home. He got to stay the night at friends, and I had to come home. Whatever the case might be, life just wasn't fair. And sometimes we can even feel like that as adults. We look at other people, and we're like, well, how come I'm going through this, that, and the other, and they're not? Life just doesn't seem Fair. Well, in Exodus chapter one, I'm not going to read the chapter. You can read it on your own time. But in Exodus chapter one, the Israelites, they were slaves to the Egyptians. Pharaoh uh, tried to kill all of the male babies during that time. You know, they Pharaoh literally tried to work them to death is what Pharaoh tried to do. And life was hard. It was miserable for them. They were mistreated. Uh, They had to deal with backbreaking labor as well as oppression you know, the Israelites were, they, they were, they were destitute. Uh, they, they, they even wondered at times if God had abandoned them. You know, life just didn't seem fair to the Israelites. They were under, they were, they were slaves to Pharaoh. They were under a lot of oppression. Uh, they were living a hard life. And for them, life was more than unfair, but thankfully God saw their suffering. And then he sent Moses to them, which in turn, eventually Moses would help deliver them and lead them to the promised land. You can read that in, in Exodus chapter one. And so when, when we find ourselves in hard situations and when life seems unfair, we need, to, we need to understand and not doubt that God is still good. We must wait on God and depend on God for, for our ability to endure as well as to overcome because there's gonna be times in life where it seems like it's just unfair. Like, like it's not fair at all, but, but God is good. And, and when it seems unfair and it doesn't seem right, you know, well, well how come this person uh, is, is everything just seems smooth sailing for them and I'm the one that's struggling and I'm the one that's having a hard time. Well, you know what? Life, yeah, sometimes it seems unfair, but God is still good. Amen. And so number one, when life is unfair, God is good. Number two, when life is scary, God is good. In Exodus chapter 8, you can read that chapter as well in your own time. Actually, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend reading 8, 9, 10, 
those three chapters uh, because it talks about the plagues of God that was sent on Egypt because Pharaoh wouldn't let the Israelites worship God and, and he wouldn't let the people go. Uh, he wanted, he kept them as slaves and he wouldn't leave the, leave the people alone. He wouldn't let them go. And so, uh, the Lord said, all right, Moses, go to, go to, uh, Pharaoh and tell him I'm going to start sending plagues in the land. And so God has sent, uh, on Egypt, plagues on Egypt to prove his power and to rescue his people. And so the Israelites and the Egyptians went through a very scary and difficult time when the plagues began to come. Uh, I can only imagine that I mean, I understand the, the Egyptians were definitely scared, but the Israelites, they were children of God. They were God's children. And yet they were like, God, what are you doing here? What? Why are we going through this? We are scared, God. There was a lot of people uh, last night. There was people scared over here about the fire and what was going on. I mean, you know, things could have turned around and it could have, you know, been bad. Um, you know, I, I wasn't so much scared. I I talked to one of the DFPA guys and they had it under control. They already had water lines around. They had a, a, a cat up there. They had spent an hour with a helicopter dumping, dumping water. I mean, it was, it, it, they had it pretty under control. But I mean, in any, any kind of, uh, there could have been a situation where it could have gotten bad and it could have gotten bad quick. But when, when times are scary, God is good. And so, the Israelites, they went through a very scary time when the plagues began to come. There was plagues of frogs. There was plagues of, of locusts, of boils, of hail, gnats, flies, darkness, and death. But in the midst of the plagues, they also saw God do some unbelievable things. They saw God save their, save their cattle. All the cattle, one of the plagues was that, that all the cattle was killed off. But yet the Israelites, none of their cattle died. But all the Egyptian cattle, they died. And so, you know, that was a plague from the Lord. And, and the Lord sent these plagues. And then he, every time he would give Pharaoh an option and Pharaoh would harden, his heart was hardened. And he was like, nope, you know what? I'm keeping the Israelites. They're staying here. They can't worship the Lord. We're not letting them go. And so the Lord's like, all right, we'll send another plague. And finally, after I think it was the eighth plague, uh, Pharaoh's eyes and, and his, was open and his heart was softened. And he began to, he, then he let the people go. But the Egyptians in particular found out the hard way that there is only one God, that there is only one God, the one true God who is powerful and just and loving. And so when we find ourselves in a scary situation and our fears are getting the best of us, we need to turn to God because God is our shepherd. He's our strength. He's our shelter. He's the one that, that covers us and comforts us. And I've said it multiple times before, but I'll say it again. I remember as a little boy getting scared and I would run to my mom and I would know that as soon as I touched my mom, if I could just but touch the hem of my mom's garment, <laughs> no, if I could just but touch my mom and be in her arms, everything was going to be okay. Everything was going to be fine. There was times where I would get scared as a little boy and I would go sleep on the floor at the foot of my parents' bed because I was scared. And I knew as long as I was in the presence of my, my mom and my dad, everything was going to be okay. And that's, that's, that's how we are as the children of God. Things happen and sometimes we get scared as adults. You know, maybe, maybe not scared because of, of you know, oh, I'm scared of the dark. Maybe not that scared, but, but what about when a, a report comes back from the doctor and you're like, oh, that wasn't the report I was expecting. You know, that can get scary. But then if you run to the arms of the Lord, he, he, he's good and he comforts you and he takes away that fear. So when, when life gets scary, God is good. Number three, don't worry, I only have 15 of these. No, I'm joking. There's only a couple left. When then we're going to get to eating. Uh, when life changes, God is good. When life changes, God is good. This is a perfect time for Pastor Janet to walk back in the room because she loves this. Change. Change is Pastor Janet's favorite thing. <laughs> she hates change. She hates change. When God brought the Israelites up out of Egypt, God took them into the desert and into the wilderness. The Israelites 
were barely out of Egypt before they started worrying, whining, and wish, uh, wishing that they could go back. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 11 through 12, it says this about the Israelites. Then they said to Moses, this is after, Mo, after Moses had led them out of uh, the land of Egypt and uh, they began to go to the promised land. They said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Verse 12. Is this not the word that the Lord uh, or that we told you in Egypt saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And so here we can see that they didn't like change. The Israelites, were, had they, they, uh, they actually, a lot of them had become accustomed to the lifestyle of the Egyptians. And they begin to live like an Egyptian, not walk like an Egyptian, but live like an Egyptian. Sorry, I got all the... The father puns today, I guess, are, are, are plague of me. But anyways, so they, they begin to live like an Egyptian, like the Egyptians were. And so they, be, they, 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 they assimilated into that culture. And so when, when Moses had brought them out of that land into the promised land, they weren't comfortable. And they, they, they were out of their comfort zone because it was changed. And not only that, but they felt like God had totally left them. Because they, 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 they didn't think they had enough food or, or, or supplies or whatever the, the, it was, the case would, was. Um, they, they were like, we're going to die out here in the world. Why didn't you just leave us back and be slaves with the Egyptians and, in, in order, in, instead of coming out here into the wilderness and dying? They hated change. A lot of us don't like change. And I can attest to the fact that the older I get, the less I like change. I don't know what it is, but it's something about age. You don't like change. The older you get, the less change you like. I've dealing, been dealing with my mom for a while now after she broke her hip. And that woman is the most stubborn. She is more stubborn than a mule. She is stubborn. And she hates change. Like if it ain't in her routine... Forget it, Jack. You ain't getting her to do it. And she will stand and, and she will kick and she will fight against you. And she's like, nope, you're not getting me up out of this chair. And I don't care what you say. And I'm like, mom, you, we've got to do this. And she's like, nope, I'm not doing it. And I'm like, oh, lady, <laughs> you know, and then she's like, I don't need my 44 year old son telling me what to do. And I'm like, <laughs> mom. You don't know how hard it is raising parents, you know, and so it's difficult, you know, as the older they get, you know, and, and, and as, as we get older, we just don't like change. Pastor Janice never liked change. That's just how she is. She doesn't like change, you know. Uh, uh, thankfully, she liked me a long time ago when I started dating her daughter and she allowed me to marry her daughter and she liked me then. And I mean, these days it's a little bit iffy sometimes, but. She, you know, maybe it was that out. It was probably my fault because I was probably nicer back then because I was probably trying to win her daughter over, right? And win the family over. So I was like, yes, ma'am. No, remember those days, right? I would say, yes, ma'am. No, sir. Yes, sir. You know, I come to their house. I'm, yes, ma'am. Rico, you want to eat with us? Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll eat with you guys. And I was like, yeah, what's for dinner? You know, it's like, you're not cooking already yet? What, what's the problem here? You know, so I'm joking. I'm joking. But... But so back then, you know, it was, uh, I mean, she, she didn't even like change back then. And not, none of us like change or, or not, not, not none of us, but a lot of us don't like change. Uh, a lot of us like the, the routine. I'm a very routine person. But, and, and I think that's why I'm starting to, to like change less is because I am super routine. Like I, every, I do things the same way every day. Every day I, I, I get up for work and it's a routine. Like I, you could watch me for two days and you could know exactly what I'm doing, what time I'm doing it, what's taking place. You know, you, you would know. That's how routine I am. Everything, it just happens like that. And, and so that's me. I, I'm a very routine person. So change is, is sometimes difficult for me. 
and I have to check myself. And, you know, I, I, although there's areas that I do like changing, you know, I, I do like changing various areas, but in a lot of areas, it's getting less and less that I like change. And so these Israelites, they, they were, they were out in the wilderness. They're like, we should have just been left in Egypt to die. We should have just been left there because this is horrible what we're going through right now. We, at least back then we had food and water and we could eat. You know, they, they, they might have been slop, but it was something, you know. So, uh, you know, we often wish that God would just let us be and leave us alone. You know, God, just leave me alone. I don't want to change, God. I don't, I don't want to, you know, I'm in my comfort zone. I'm in my comfort zone, my zone, my lane, whatever you want to call it. And I don't want to change. I just want to be who I am and be the same. And God say, no, I've called you to be different. I need you to change. And so sometimes, you know, when, when we give our hearts to the Lord and give our lives to the Lord, then, then God starts working on us to change some things. And sometimes those things that he's asking us to change, it doesn't necessarily feel comfortable because we've been so used to doing that forever and ever and ever. Amen. And it's hard. You know, we, a lot of times people are like, well, you know what? I, my family, we've just, we've always had a hard time. And my family, they've always struggled. And, and my family, they, you know, they just, they've always had the, the, the short end of the stick. You know, and, and now, now you start serving God and God's like, you know what? You're an overcomer. You're a winner. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I'm just quoting some scriptures to you. That, that, that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. You know, and, and God's trying to change your mindset. And you're like, but God, I'm so used to thinking that, that, that we, we always, my family always gets a short end of the stick. God, I'm so used to thinking that we always lose, that we always get the, 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 the downside of the hill. We're always trekking up the mountain, God. And God's like, no, no, you got to understand you're on the winning team now. And so God tried to change our mind. And, and that's where the battle lies is within our mind. And, and if we, if we can get over that, then we can overcome so many things in our life. Um, but but our, we're so used to that old, what, what, what Pastor Jeff used to always say, my father-in-law, what he used to always say is, we were so used to that old stinking thinking and we would hold on to that stuff. And, and God's trying to get you to think, no, you know what? You are a child of God and I am victorious, amen? And so these, these Israelites here, they, they, just, they just wish that they would have, been left alone. But in Exodus, uh, the next two uh, verses down, Exodus 14, uh, 13 and 14, it says this. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Verse 14. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. And so thankfully, Moses said something very valuable here to them that we need to remember. When we find ourselves going through all kinds of changes and when life seems out of control, then we need to listen to the words that Moses said here. Be still and trust in God. Be still and trust in God. When things are changing, things are shifting. Sometimes there are shifting uh, periods in our lives where where things begin to shift and things begin to change. Understand this, that God is still good. Yeah. God is good no matter what, and that he is with you, and you can trust in him because he has never failed you. So when life changes, God is good. Yeah. Number four, when life is sad, God is good. You know, the saddest day in history was when the most innocent man and most sinless man named Jesus died on the cross for your and my sins. But thankfully, the saddest day in history turned into the happiest day in history three days later when he rose from the grave and he was living again. And so Jesus' Jesus' death and resurrection teaches us God's plan to save all of us from our sins. And so that after we die, we can live and be in, in heaven for eternity. And so when we find ourselves going through times of sadness, and unfortunately there's many things that make us sad in life 
or that can make us sad in life, whether it be a sickness or a death of a loved one. Um, maybe it's experiencing broken families. Maybe it's um, the loss of a job or, or the loss of a friend or, you know, something of that nature. There's a lot of things that can make us sad. But during these times, God is with us and God is good. You know, we, go, we all go through various sad times in our life. You know, there's uh, with my mom, back to my mom, because I've been dealing with her a lot uh, this last year with, with her broken hip and everything. And, and I, can, I can see her health is declining lately. Um, she, her, she's getting weaker. She's fell uh, a couple times in the last couple weeks. Um, even, even after, even, uh, after her broken hip, she's fell a couple times. Um, she's forgetting a lot more. You know, she, I can see, I can see in her physical body, uh, the appearance of her, of her health declining a little bit, little by little. And, uh, and that makes me sad. You know, I mean, that's, that's my mom and, and that makes me sad. And so I, I think, you know, God, why, why can't you just heal her? Why can't you do this, that, or the other? You know, and, and I don't know why God doesn't do those things, but we go through sad things in life. But nonetheless, I still know that God is good and God is in control. And, uh, and you know, things are going to happen. And, and unfortunately, according to the word, it's appointed to man, to every man to die. You know, there's only two that haven't died. Enoch was one of them. And Enoch and, help me, Tim, Elijah, thank you. Enoch and Elijah were the only two that, have ne- that they, they just beam me up, Scotty. And there they were, they were in heaven. You know, that's what I'm waiting for. Lord, beam me up. But God, I want to be on a ride of my life on the sand dunes, Lord, when you beam me up. Let me be on the highest sand dunes so I don't have to go very far. <laughs> Beam me up when I'm on a ride of my life, Lord. But, you know, th- those are the only two that died. And, you know, sometimes we experience death, and that's very sad. You know, some, uh, and, and some people say, well, you know, you, you know it's coming, and so you can prepare for it. Yeah, I get that, but it's still sad. It's still sad. Yeah, it's really tragic, tragic when it's sudden, and that kind of stuff happens when it's sudden, and you don't get a chance to maybe say goodbye or whatever. That's, that's, that's horrible. But it, it's nonetheless, all of that's sad. But we can know, we can know this, that uh, above and beyond all that, God is still good. Amen. And so when life is sad, God is good. Let me finish with this last point. When life is good, God is good. When life is good, God is good. It isn't always about unfairness. It isn't always about fear. It isn't always about change. It isn't always about sadness. We can expect life will will have the have those times, but we can also expect that life is going to have some times of ease and some times of calm. There will be those seasons in life in which it seems like life is just kind of on cruise control and it's it just feels easy or it feels calm. And I got news for you that God is good during those times too. When we face bad times and good times, we need to understand that God is faithful throughout them all. Not just the bad times, but he's also faithful in the good times. God is always faithful and he is the ultimate provider. God wants to bless his children and provide for his children. An important lesson that we can learn is that people might uh, might be prone to turn away from God in the good times as well as they are in the bad times. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, let me read it to you. It says this. There you go. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land which, you, which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build, Houses full of all good things, which you did not fill. Home, hewn out walls, which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees, which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then be, beware 
lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. In essence, when everything is going good, don't forget the goodness of God. Don't forget that, you know what? God is good. When life is good, we need to remember that it is, God, it is good because God is good. That's why it's good. It's because God is good. And keep God in his rightful place in our lives, especially in the good times. Unfortunately, in the good times is when people tend to put God up on a shelf. And, and, God, and they say, all right, God, everything's good. You're up on the shelf. I don't need you right now. But what we don't understand and what people, some people don't understand is you need God. I need God all the time. It doesn't matter if it's bad, if it's good. We need him all the time. And then when they put him up on the shelf in the good times and then tragedy strikes, something happens and they're like, oh, they pick God up off the shelf. They blow the dust off and they say, God, let me rub this genie bottle because now I need an answer. Now is when I need you, God, because all hell is breaking loose and, and it is getting chaotic and crazy right now. Women are thinking they're men. Men are thinking they're women. Women's going into men's bathrooms. Men's going into women's bathroom. I did that the other day on accident. Not because I identify. I was in Dairy Queen and I and, and I I took my dad in there, me and my mom, or I took me and my dad took my mom to get her hair done, to get a perm. And my dad loves hamburgers, especially uh, he, he really likes those Dairy Queen hamburgers. I don't know why, but he loves hamburgers. He's always asking me, Rico, bring me a hamburger and fries at home. And so I'm like, all right, so I'll bring him a hamburger and fries home. And so we went and we, we dropped my mom off. I made sure she was situated at the, the, the beauty salon, which is just up the road, uh, stone's throw away from uh, Dairy Queen. And uh, so I made sure she's all situated. She's good. She's got a perm in. She's sitting there. She's letting it do her thing, working some magic. And uh, so my dad's like, give me the nod, like, mm, let's go, you know. So we hop in the van and we go down to Burger King or uh, to Dairy Queen and uh, we order and and, uh, and we go sit down at the table. And I just I, I had to go to the restroom. So I walk into the restroom. I did not even pay attention to the signage on the door. And I start taking care of business. And I'm like, wait a minute. Why is there no stalls up in this joint? And there was somebody else in there. And I'm like, we are going to exit stage left as fast as possible. I don't think I ever washed my hands so fast. And I rushed back to the table and sat down as fast as I could. So the lady that was in there, because I, I could tell she was about ready to be done and come out. And I'm like, Lord, let me get back to the table before somebody sees me. And so I went in there, but you know, not on purpose, not because I identify, but you know, we, we come into crazy, we're at crazy times these days and people want to pull God off the shelf and be like, God, it is chaotic right now. Well, what about where was, why didn't you, why didn't you ask God or talk with God in the good times too? You know, he's good in the good times as well as he's good in the bad times is my point. And so, you know, uh, don't put him on a shelf just because things are going good. You know, it's easy to put God on the shelf when you're on the mountaintop. But it's when you're in the valley and you're starting to climb and make that climb up the mountain. You're like, God, I need you. God, it, it, I don't know if I'm going to make it to the top here, God. I don't know if I can survive this hike. God, I need you right now. And God's like, well, yeah, but you needed me when you were on the mountaintop too. Why didn't you call out to me then? Amen. And there's, there's no condemnation. There's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to bring guilt on you. I'm just saying, rem, remember God in the good times, when, when things are going good, when your bills are paid, when there's food on the table, when there's clothes on your back, when you have fuel in your car, or you even have a car, when you can afford the fuel to put in your car, when, when you can afford the few, food to put on your table because it's only getting more expensive, when you can afford to go out and have fun and do extracurricular activities. Remember God in those times. You know, we, we always, even when the boys were little and, and uh, when we first started going and riding, we would, I, we would get in the car and we would have everything loaded, the toys loaded up and we'd get ready to head off the driveway and we would always stop 
and we still to this day, although the boys are in their own car now, and uh, but me and Christy, we always we always stop and we pray, and we 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 say thank you God that we have the ability to even go out and do this stuff and have fun. Some people don't have the ability to go out and do extra stuff. You know, we're blessed. Not that they can't be blessed, but they can be blessed. You have to choose to want to be blessed because God wants to bless you. Amen. Let me close uh, with this scripture, Joshua 1 and 9. This will be the last scripture. After the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, and you... For you and all this people to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. As I said to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong. And of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So Joshua was given this command saying, I am with you wherever you go. Be strong and don't be afraid. God is good and God is near. God is ready to help all of us, especially when life gets wild. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. Thank you, Stream family, for joining in with us. I pray this message uh, blessed you and ministered to you. And I hope it reminds you that God is good no matter what's going on in life. We love you guys. Don't forget, next Sunday, we won't be having service. Uh, we'll probably have Nick Marshall on uh, doing a quick little blurb on a uh, live stream for you. Um, probably be located out on the sand dunes, and so there might be a little extra noise going on. But nonetheless, he'll be out there to... Uh, to uh, give a little blurb to you. So God bless you. Thank you for joining in.